Tiki Hut Media. Hey there, welcome to Soul Ramblings Podcast. I'm Jerry Wicker, and we are in the midst of a series called God Is. Today is week two of that. God is blank, and we are trying to, and together, searching for ways to fill that, discovering how to fill that space with truth. God is blank. And we began this series last week when we talked about how God is always pursuing us, even when we least deserve it. And that characteristic is a hallmark of his mercy. You know, all of us have sinned and fall short of God's standard, which creates a barrier between us and our perfect holy God. But in God's mercy, he sent Jesus to take the punishment we deserved, death, and create a way for us to have eternal life with him. So God's mercy means we don't get what we deserve, but it doesn't stop there. God's mercy isn't just about providing us a way out. It's also about God making his way in. He didn't just remove our sin. He sent his son. He made a way by meeting us where we were, as we were. Jesus came as Emmanuel, God with us. He experienced every human emotion, and his earthly life is evidence of God's desire to draw near to us. And in that nearness, we find God's mercy. You know, throughout the Gospels, we see several examples of people asking Jesus to have mercy on them. One powerful example is described in Luke 17 when some people with leprosy approach Jesus. Now, for context, leprosy at that time made people untouchable outcasts. According to the Levitical law of the time, they were considered ceremonially unclean, meaning that anyone who touched them would also become unclean. But as God incarnate, Jesus is clean. He is pure, holy, and perfect. As the lepers approached him, they cry out for mercy. Jesus tells them to go to the priests, the protocol per the law, and as they go, they are healed. Jesus essentially fulfills the law in reverse. Instead of becoming unclean by touching them, he transfers his own holiness to cover their uncleanness. And that is a perfect symbol of what Jesus did for each of us through his death and resurrection. God didn't just remove our sin, pain, and brokenness. He met us in it through the person of Jesus. When we accept salvation in Christ, we experience God's mercy. But again, it's even more than that. We experience God's mercy not only through our salvation, but also in moments of pain, grief, and desperation, just as the lepers experienced. So if you're in a tough season right now, cry out for God's mercy. He's with you. He is near, and he's able to heal, restore, and redeem. So look for opportunities to see God's mercy in your life and to be merciful to others today. As we continue with week two of God Is, we look at God Is Living Without Worry. Our scripture reading for the morning comes to us from Matthew's gospel. We're in the sixth chapter, starting with the 25th verse. Let us hear these holy words. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, Even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? 
for it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. The word of God for the people of God. God. Gracious God, we thank you that you promise to be with us always. Thank you that your presence is with us right now. Today we give you our hearts, our minds, and our lives. Come speak your words of life into our beings. We pray that you would deepen our comprehension, broaden our thinking, transform our understanding. For you are our wise counselor, our perfect teacher, and our faithful friend. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of these, our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. We are in a series, this is week number two, called God Is, and then fill in the blank. This week, you might have guessed from our scripture reading, God is living without worry. We're a worrisome folk, aren't we? What is it that keeps you up at night when you're laying in bed and your mind won't shut off? What are you thinking about? Let me, let me put it another way, a little bit differently. What is it that you're worried about. I recently read an article, and I didn't know if I would ever get a chance to use this in a sermon, but this is it. This article was written in the scientific journal Nature, and the headline caught my attention. What is the best way to swat a fly? I always rolled up a newspaper or magazine or the good old fly swatter, right? Well, according to this scientific journal, you take two pieces of tissue paper, one in each hand. And if there's a fly here, you slowly move your hands to and fro like this, getting ever closer to the fly, getting ever closer, ever closer. And then all of a sudden, with both hands, and you've swatted the fly. The fly won't fly away. And according to the, to the scientific journal, this is what it said. The fly with its makeup cannot cope with this situation. <laughs> Since its central nervous system circuitry is geared to avoid approaching movement in only one part of its visual field at a time. Two simultaneously approaching threats render that fly immobile. I don't know who paid for this study, but I found it fascinating. (laughs) Our tax dollars may have paid for it, I don't know. But the fly is rendered immobile in that situation. And its central nervous system cannot compute which angle to take off when it's got that imposing threat threat coming in on both sides. Some of you are ahead of me already because many of us are like that fly. We have worries that make us feel overwhelmed. We're crushed by the responsibilities we have to take care of. We feel like things are coming at us in every direction. And thus, like that fly, we become immobilized. We don't know which way to go, which way to move, which way to turn. And I'm not sure where this came from. I found these statistics as it relates to worry. 40% of the time, we worry about things that will never happen. 30% concern things that can't be changed no matter how much we worry about them. 12% center on criticism, mostly untrue, 
made by people who feel they're inferior, by the way. 10% relate to health concerns, which ironically worsens when you worry. Only 8% are legitimate concerns which you can actually do something about. Most of the time we worry about things that will never happen and we can't do anything about anyway. Some have said that worry is the interest you pay on trouble that seldom comes. Psychologists have said, now that statistic had 40% of the time we worry about things that will never happen. A survey of psychologists said that 90% of what people worry about never comes to pass. It has been said that worry is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but you won't get anywhere. There's a story of a guy, he had this issue. He had one of those metal garbage cans and over time the bottom had become rusted and it had several holes in the bottom of it and he decided he wanted to get rid of this trash can. So he did like anybody would do. On trash day, his trash ran once a week. On trash day, he set it out by the curb by the regular garbage can, thinking the garbage man will take it off. He pulls in in the afternoon after the garbage has run, the garbage service has run. That garbage can is sitting neatly by the empty garbage can that had the garbage in it. He thought, well, okay. They didn't realize they were supposed to take it off. I know what I'll do next week. Next week, he takes it, turns it upside down. This way, they'll see that it's rusted out on the bottom. It's got holes in it. I intend for it to be thrown away. Sure enough, he comes home that second week. It's set upright, and it's sitting next to the empty garbage can. So he thought, I know what I'll do. He goes, gets a sledgehammer out of his shop. And he beats that thing to a pulp. And he just, I mean, just hammers it and hammers it and hammers it. Gets it almost flat. Sets it out by the garbage can. Surely now they'll know to pick that up and just throw it away. He pulls in. That afternoon the garbage runs. It's not only sitting next to the empty garbage can, but the garbage man had apparently tried to beat it back into shape for him. He's frustrated. So he said, you know what? He goes to the hardware store. He gets a heavy-duty chain and a padlock. He's got a big oak tree in his front yard. He chains that garbage can, padlocks it. And sure enough, before the garbage runs the next morning, in the overnight, somebody had stolen his garbage can. (laughs) Worry is a lot like that garbage can. We know we need to get rid of it, but it is not so easy to do. We can say, yes, yes, I need to quit worrying so much. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yes, Jesus, I hear what you're saying. I need to quit worrying. I need to quit worrying. It's not so easy to do, though. The pressures of modern life, the worries those pressures bring, They've had a devastating effect on every one of us. Billions upon billions of dollars are tied up every year for the cost and treatment of those who are driven to mental illness brought on by anxiety and worry, and it characterizes so much of our society today. But to be honest, this is not a problem unique to us in our time in 2023. As a matter of fact, The crowd that was listening to Jesus in our scripture reading this morning could identify with it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have brought it up. They were worriers back then, too. But as was typical of his teaching, Jesus put the problem in perspective by pointing out some things that everybody could understand. He pointed toward the sky and said, Look at the birds of the air, those little insignificant sparrows. 
They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? That made sense. It has always been true that the God who has provided life also provides the necessities to keep life going. The point, of course, is it's not that the birds and animals are taken care of without work. In other words, the birds aren't just sitting there saying, okay, Jesus, feed me. No, that's obviously not true. As a matter of fact, I read somewhere that someone said, no one works harder than the average sparrow to make a living. But the message that Jesus has given us here and giving those original listeners is that they do not worry about their living. And if they, who are so much lower than we in God's scheme of creation, don't have to worry, then why should we? As a matter of fact, Jesus goes on to explain, what good does this do? That's the thrust of what he says next when he says, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? Anybody here ever worried? If your hand is not raised up, I'm calling you on the carpet. (laughs) We're all guilty of worrying, aren't we? Did it add one hour to your life? Absolutely not. I tend to think that had Jesus been speaking to us today, this morning, he might have pointed out that, that indeed excessive worry has exactly the opposite effect. Not only will worry not not add any years to your life, it'll probably subtract from them. And those that you do have left are going to be of a poorer quality. The necessities of life, the length of life, the quality of life, they're all things that tend to worry us a great deal. But Jesus' message is clear. None of them should particularly concern us because... The God who gives us life in the first place will most assuredly be in control of all the rest. This jumped out off the page at me when I was reading and preparing for this morning. Jesus sums this all up, this problem of worry, in that one little phrase. I hadn't noticed it before. You of little Faith. That seems to be what he's been driving at this whole time. He's not been trying to tell us that we should not plan ahead. He's not telling us that we should not be diligent. He is not telling us that we shouldn't be careful and prudent. He's not trying to tell us that we should be totally unconcerned with our lives or the kind of life that we have. He just doesn't want us to come to the place where we begin to think that we're the only ones that can fix this. We're the only ones. We're here. We're doing it all on our own. That's pride. Because we're not alone. In fact, we have a loving God who, Jesus said, knows that we need all of these things. One who is in it with us to such an extent that even the things that we don't even think about, we take for granted, like birds and lilies and grass, they're taken care of as well. If we remember that, we will not have to worry. But there's another very practical side to this whole question of worry. If we spend too much time at it, We'll not have time for anything else. Here's what I mean. You notice Jesus ends this passage by saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, food, clothing, and so on. They'll be yours as well. Think about it. If we spend our energies worrying about whether or not we have enough food to eat, we never begin to be concerned 
if somebody else has enough food to eat. If we spend our energies worrying about our health and the length of our own life, we're not going to have time to care about another person's health. And if we become overly concerned about what clothes we have to wear, we surely will not be able to concern ourselves with somebody else's need for basic clothing. The message of Jesus seems to be here that the way to overcome worry about yourself is to be concerned about others. Concerned about others first. That's what kingdom living is all about. That is seeking first the kingdom of God. Caring for others first. Being concerned for others. The poet put it beautifully when she wrote, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. What Jesus wants us to know is that we do indeed have such a heavenly father. And because of that, we don't need to spend all our time worrying about the necessities of life. We can live one day at a time and not to have to be overly concerned with the potential disasters that we see maybe, possibly, could be looming over on the horizon Remember, Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today, today's trouble is enough for today. Near the end of his life, Mark Twain said this, I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened common ailment worry is. Who needs it? Not God's people. That's why the Apostle Paul could write to the Philippians, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Replace that worry with prayer and supplication. And then instead of worry and anxiety, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will rule and guard your hearts and minds. Who is God? God is living without worry. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are a God who's trustworthy. Thank you that you have been faithful in the past. Thank you that you are faithful today because you're with us. And thank you that you will be faithful in the future. Amen. We continue next week with week three of God is when we look at God being the place you can go when you feel like God can't love you, when you feel like God can't possibly love you. Be sure to tune in next week. Get social with us on Soul Ramblings podcast on Instagram and Facebook. We got links to those pages in the show notes. Go over there and follow us. And wherever you're listening today. Be sure to go and subscribe, and that way you never miss a new episode of Soul Ramblings Podcast. I want to thank you for the gift and privilege of your time today, and I'll leave you with this for this week from Philippians 4.8. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely and all that is worthy of praise. 
I'm Jerry Wicker. We'll see you next week on Soul Ramblings Podcast. Until then, grace and peace. peace. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already, subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production. <laughs>